You are now tuned. Talkline Network Radio, America's longest running Jewish broadcast network, the voice of the Jewish community. Welcome to the podcast. And now. You're listening to Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. And now, here's your host. We are back, and we're looking at circumcision. A new group would like to see circumcision not welcome. They want to cut it out from the Jewish community. Lisa Braver Moss joined us, co-founder of President Bruchem. Uh, she has an article that was called A Painful Case, appeared in Tikkun magazine in 1990s, one of the first long-form pieces to challenge the circumcision tradition from a Jewish perspective. Since then, she has written and lectured extensively on being both an active, engaged Jew and a vocal circumcision critic inspired by the efforts of Jewish institutions to welcome and include Jews of diverse backgrounds. She envisioned a similar effort for Jewish circumcision objectors laying the framework for Bruchem. She's an award-winning novelist, prolific nonfiction writer. She's co-author of Celebrating Brit Shalom, a guidebook on alternative bris, as well as The Measure of His Grief, a novel about a Berkeley doctor, his Jewish identity, and the circumcision controversy. Elio Unger Sargon is founding executive board member of Bruchim. He grew up in an Orthodox Jewish family in Brookline, Massachusetts. At age 13, he and his family moved to Israel. He decided not to serve in the Israeli Defense Forces, choosing instead to study medicine in the UK. Three years into his degree, he left medicine to pursue a career in film. After earning two degrees from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, Elio completed his first feature film documentary called Cut, Slicing Through the Mitts of Circumstances. Circumcision. He has since released his second feature-length documentary, A People Without a Land, and his co-host of the podcast Four Cubits. And Rabbi Benjamin Silver is the spiritual leader of the Young Israel of Long Beach. Everybody, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Let me begin Thank with you for having us. Uh, our, our pleasure, Lisa. Let me just get started off with you because you've been an anti-circumcision activist going back to at least 1990 through your Tikkun magazine. What problems do you have with circumcision, an age-old tradition, thousands of years old, that unites every single Jew throughout the world? So what is your objection to circumcision? Well, my objection is, is, very, is really very personal. I, um, I have two sons. They're both circumcised, and this was not a good experience for me. It was, a, it was an experience during which I couldn't, I couldn't feel God's presence. And I began to write about my uh, my experience. Um, when I you say you couldn't very... feel God's presence, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean that I don't. It it didn't feel as if this this act was something God wanted me to do to me. And and not being a halachic Jew, not being an, an observant Jew, but being a reformed Jew, um, I I just began thinking about it from that perspective and wrote about it for many years and then wrote about other things and then wrote the novel and and so on and um and so i think my objection to circumcision is it it just it it is traumatic it's traumatic for the infant um i feel that it was traumatic for me as well um and and it, but this this organization that we're we've formed called bruhim is um is really not about the objections to circumcision so much as it's about the idea that families, some families are opting out of circumcision in the Jewish community. And what do we want to do about that? What do we, do we want these families in the fold or, or, or not? And um, so that's my, that's my thumbnail sketch. Okay. Uh, out of curiosity, you said you didn't feel God's presence. When do you feel God's presence? Oh, I feel God's presence when I'm singing, when I'm when I'm uh, at services sometimes, um, when I light Shabbat candles. Um, I I feel God's presence sometimes, um, and yeah, this was not this was not, these were not occasions where I felt that. Let me turn to Yo Unger Sargon, founding executive board member of Bruchim. So tell us about your perspective, why you oppose circumcision. Absolutely. And thank you so much for having us on, Rabbi Brenner. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and to share our thoughts with your audience. Um, 
I started thinking critically about circumcision when I was about 18 years old, and I was given the great honor of being a sandik at uh, my first cousin's bris. And being in that kind of proximity to the ritual really um, gave me a different perspective on it. Uh, I saw him uh, in excruciating pain. I saw the mohel bend down and perform mitzitzah bepeh. And when he came up, he had a little bit of blood on his beard. And these images and this experience kind of seared themselves into my my uh, mind and I started thinking critically about this uh, this rite this ritual um, that is no doubt a central and important rit ritual in the Jewish tradition but one that I had ethical concerns about um, as Lisa mentioned it's uh, it's it's a painful traumatic experience for the infant and I think an argument could be made for the parents, uh, for the new parents. And uh, so I started thinking about what is it that we do as committed Jews, as serious Jews, Jews who value the Jewish tradition, when our ethical and moral compass come into conflict with elements of the tradition. And uh, I've been on a journey trying to talk about that in a creative and constructive way ever since I made my film cut, Slicing Through the Myths of Circumcision, as you mentioned uh, when you were reading my bio. And I've been having conversations with Jews and non-Jews about this issue ever since. Do you regret having a circumcision yourself? Uh, I don't regret it in the sense that it's not something that I had any control. No, it's just great if you had a control. Would, in other words, you give circumcision. I don't know if you're married or with children or if you have a son or not, but if you do, uh, did you give circumcision if you had a child or would you if, if you would have one? I have not been blessed with children, but I would not circumcise a son were I to be blessed with a son. And uh, I think that I would be giving him a lot of Jewish tradition, and um, I would be imparting a love for the tradition that I continue to have to this day. I, I learn regularly. I'm engaged in the Jewish community. But this is a ritual. This is a rite that I consider to be wrong, and I would not do it. Let me turn to Rabbi Yom and Silver. You've heard uh, both our guests of their perspective. Obviously, with bris milah, circumcision, is such an important part of Judaism. It's an entry level, at least for men, into the Jewish religion. So just want to get your perspective because there is an attack on circumcision, both as you hear from the Jewish community, this group called Bruchum, and you hear outside the community, people have been talking about banning bris milah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rebzev, uh, for the opportunity to you know stand up for authentic Yiddishkeit. I really do appreciate the conversation. Nice to meet you, Eliyahu. Nice to meet you, Lisa. I Thanks. could not disagree nice with you guys you. more on every single level. Um, you know, not only not only is there a discussion to be had from the philosophical standpoint of the meaning of Brismila, but I think it goes well beyond that. And I thought that your comments, Lisa and Eliyahu, were both interesting and kind of revolve around the same point to which I fundamentally disagree. And that is, is that, you know, Lisa, you mentioned you didn't feel a closeness to God during the Brismila and Elio, you said this offends your ethical and moral sensibilities. I would argue that to the extent that we accept and believe that the God, that the Torah is the word of God, divinely given, and of course, as a proud Orthodox Jew, I believe that every word was dictated and given from God to Moses, as is. It's actually incumbent upon us to reflect on this from a totally different perspective. And that is that if we find something that God told us to do that appears to be in conflict with our morals and our ethics, then it's incumbent upon us to adjust our morals and ethics to coincide and be consistent with God, not the contrary. So to take something that God said and said, you know, I don't feel God in that way. I, to me, that doesn't make any sense. On the contrary, if God said to do it, it must be, it must be that that's meaningful and has deep, deep roots. And it's exactly what we're supposed to, supposed to be doing. So to say that it offends our moral sensibilities, perhaps our moral sensibilities are off caliber. So that's, if I can, if I can respond, that, that's a, a very particular perspective on how to deal with the conflict that I was outlining in my previous comments. And in a way, it's it's interesting because we find ourselves now in between Parshat Lech Lecha and Parshat Vayera. 
And in this week's Parsha, we had a lot of Avraham acquiescing to God's wishes. But in next week's Parsha, we have a, a slightly different Avraham. We have an Avraham who argues with God over the destruction of Sodom and Amorah. And he famously says uh, to God, Hashofet kol ha'aretz lo yasamishpat, will the judge of all the world not perform justice? Now, for Abraham to say that to God, he has to be taking a different approach to what you just articulated. He has to be taking an approach in which you can stand on moral grounds and even argue with God himself. And from my perspective, this is one of the most amazing, revolutionary, and beautiful things about the Jewish tradition, that we have that value in the Jewish tradition, that when it comes down to it, if we feel our moral sensibilities are being offended even by God himself, we can argue that. And I think Abraham in Vayera, in arguing for against the destruction of Sodom and Amorah, demonstrates that beautifully. Rabbi I, Silver. Again, I firmly, firmly disagree with that. I, th I, I think that our, our moral sensibilities are 100% dictated by God, and I do not think that's the lesson to be learned or derived in any way from, uh, from the dialogue that occurs in Parshas Vayera that you, re that you reference. Is uh, on the contrary. I think it was there understood that indeed it was a dialogue, but it was understood, and as you see from the back and forth, as the, as the conversation continues, right, that God Himself was open to that dialogue and in fact appreciated it. But that's very different from saying when there's a clear dictate that you can just willy nilly do away with it because you find it offensive. But Rabbi, I can... Reb, yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Lisa, please. Oh, well, I'm just wondering, Rabbi Silver, um, do you. <laughs> What do you think should be done about these Jewish families who are deciding not to circumcise? So I'm glad you raised that, Lisa. I think that's a very different question than our approach to what circumcision should be, right? I think that on, on the contrary, as God-fearing Jews in our belief system, in our, and based on our belief that this is what God wants, it's incumbent upon us to educate them and show them the beauty and be, allow them to be able to find God in something that, of course, appears to be, I think, as you said, ungodly. That's our duty. Yeah, I didn't, to, I didn't to embrace actually, them. This, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't say ungodly. I, I made a very personal statement about my own authentic spirituality, and it's not that. It's not, it's not Brittany Law. Um, and I don't see how that's really something that can be argued at, at all. It's just my personal experience, which is, which is how I got involved in this work. Um, I think, you know, you said something about authenticity, and I think that's what, that's what I'm saying here, too, is that the four families that are not halachic, they're not orthodox families, they, they, so maybe by your standards, they're doing everything all wrong, but they exist. And, and the question is, you know, how do we, how do we want to move forward with, with these families? And so that's what Brookheim is really about. It's about making sure those families don't fall through the cracks, making sure they realize that even though they didn't do one mitzvah, or they didn't do it the way it was supposed to be done, that doesn't mean they can't do other mitzvot and be involved in the Jewish community and be and, and, and have an active role. And um, yeah, I mean, this was something I did completely without kavanah. And I know the spiritual intent, and I know that from an Orthodox perspective that you do the mitzvah anyway, even if you don't have kavanah, but there's also there's also reason to uh, to think oh kavanaugh is required by and the way I'm it's not just an orthodox issue conservative and reform rabbis also adhere to the circumcision ritual it's not yes, just limited uh, to the yes, orthodox it's a unifying fact it's the entry level to being jewish well perhaps so perhaps so i i would i would argue that uh that it's not the entry level ri ritual that it's that it's something, maybe it's in a way expedient to to do a circumcision on on one's child. That um, as a way of saying, I don't know what else I'm going to do to raise this child Jewishly, but I know I'm going to do this, and then I'm then I'll be done with it. And so I think it can be it can be seen either way, really. I think I think what's so at least so you, you around, I just wanted to. Yeah, please. I'm sorry. I, I just I just wanted to say I think something that that would help to clarify this conversation is 
that the conversation in the non-orthodox world is different fundamentally, I think, from the conversation in the orthodox world. And that, that comes down to what role does circumcision play in these different worlds? And in the orthodox world, I think uh, Rabbi Silver did a very good job of articulating the approach. Um, and I, I, in the non-orthodox world, it's a slightly different issue, right? Because in the non-orthodox world, their approach to halakha is much more, shall we say, malleable. Um, and so the conversation there is different. But I do want to respond to Rabbi Silver and just say that I think what leaves me lacking, you know, coming from an Orthodox background and, and being a vocal critic of, of circumcision, I get two sorts of responses. The first response is what Rabbi Silver articulated, which is how do you deal with someone who has problems with elements of the tradition? It's a sort of Kirov approach, right? We have to sort of show them the beauty. We have to bring them back. We have to bring them back into the fold. They're straying off. That's one response uh, that I've that I've encountered. And it honestly, to me, feels, you know, a little bit insulting to my intelligence because we're not sort of talking on the same level. You're trying to persuade me of something. And the other sort of approach that I get from... The other approach I, I get from the Orthodox, the other response I get from the Orthodox world, which is also not very satisfying, and I'll explain why in a second, is this is a package deal, right? You can't pick and choose. You have to you have to accept all of it or accept none of it. And the reason that, that leaves me cold is because I learn Gemara. I learn Medrash. I am so thoroughly invested in the beauty of the Jewish tradition and the idea that someone would say to me, you either take it all or you leave it all, it's kind of like a slap in the face. It's like saying, cut off a part of your body. Well, once I, I don't think Rabbi Silver said you have to either accept it or reject it. Or it's not what he said at all. I'll let him. It's not. It's not. He he was adhering to what I'm characterizing as the Kirov approach. Um, but from my perspective, when someone approaches me that way, I feel like they're trying to sell me something. They're trying to persuade me of something instead of having a good faith argument. Like we're well, having but right you're now, also trying. Really but you're appreciate. also trying to sell people, in fairness, that that you don't have to be circumcised in order to be Jewish. You're trying well, to sell the concept as well. Well, so that's interesting because Bruchim specifically, what we're doing with this organization, and this is a bit of a subtle point, but I, I think it really bears repeating. Lisa mentioned it. We're not trying to convince people not to circumcise their children. That is explicitly not our mission as an organization. What we're doing is we're saying there's a reality in the world of Jews who have chosen not to circumcise their sons. And what happens to those people after they make that decision? We are trying to foster uh, a much more inclusive attitude towards those people because quite frankly, uh, through our meetings over the past year that have been growing month by month, I keep meeting Jews who are completely alienated from the Jewish tradition and from traditional Jewish spaces over this issue. And we, Lisa and I, and, and at Bruchim, we feel like that's a big problem and we want to change that. We want those people to feel welcome in the Jewish community. We want them to feel connected to their Jewish identity. Rabbi so Silver. If, if I may respond for on, on a few of the points, and, and thank you for your, articulating your position, position, Elio. Number one, I don't think that an attempt to educate uh, should be just, you know, shoot away as some sort of poo-pooing Kirov approach. I don't think that's correct. I think any, if, if, if you put this in the context of a parent-child relationship, right? Children, and thankfully I'm blessed with three boys, uh, and by the way, to, to each of whom I sat and felt incredibly connected to God as the circumcision took place. And, uh, you know, when a child does something that is, uh, it is not inconsistent with what you think should be their guiding light, is inconsistent with the way that you think will empower them the most to lead a fulfilling life, do you just let them be? Do you create it? Do you create an organization to foster their bad behavior? No, of course not. You you try to show them the beauty. You try to show them the error of their ways. You try to educate them. I don't think that's a cure of approach. On the contrary, I think that's what we all do. That's I think that's 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 standard. And to speak to your point, Lisa, um, of course it's not an all or nothing. Um, Yiddishkeit is comprised of many many different elements, and obviously each of us face our own different challenges. For some of us. Certain of the commandments are easier and certain are more difficult. And we all face our own difficult challenges. And never would I or I hope any Orthodox rabbi reject anyone just because 
they uh, they were they failed to perform a particular mitzvah or or, or or something to that extent. That being said, I think creating an organization that fosters and encourages that behavior is terrible. Hmm. When we come back, I want to pick up on these points. Our guest, Elio Unger Sargon, founding executive board member, Lisa Bravamas, co founder, president of the Bruchim, their group that's a support group for those that do not want to do circumcision and want to cut it out as part of the Jewish experience. Rabbi Benjamin Silver is the spiritual leader of the young Israel of Long Beach. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Talkline Radio and TV with Zeb Brenner is just phenomenal. Everybody concerned about the Jewish community should listen and watch. He has the best guests. He asks the most interesting questions. He's always so well prepared. It's talk radio and television from a Jewish point of view at its very best. To advertise on the Talkline network and Talkline's email and social media blasts reaching over 70,000 people, please call 212-769-1925, extension 100. That's 212-769-1925, extension 100. Or email info at talklinenetwork.com. You're listening to Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. And now, here's your host. Okay, we're back. We're looking at circumcision and the fact that there is a support group that supports those that or don't want to do circumcision and make it part of the Jewish ritual. Our guests are Lisa Brava Moss and Elio Unger Sargon of the group called Bruchim, which make themselves welcome to those that oppose circumcision. Rabbi Benjamin Silver is a spiritual leader of the young Israel of, of Long Beach. Let's go to Newark, New Jersey. Oh, get, uh, go ahead, Devorah, Newark, your question or comment. Go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm surprised that we've not been specific about what what a verse is concerning. It's about cutting a covenant. It's how we make covenant with God. And this was this was uh, why the Almighty instituted circumcision. He made covenant with Abraham, Abraham of Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, I well, I'm also remembering a conversation I had in the 80s with Annette Baum of Blessed Memory. She was director of interreligious affairs for the Union of American Hebrew Congregations. And she was very concerned about circumcision, but not in the way your guests are. She was concerned that because circumcision was so central to the Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish uh, reality, and because she was a Jewish feminist, I met her at a Feminist of Faith meeting, she wanted to find a way that women, that girls, that baby girls or, or young girls could have something comparable that would in the same way be inclusive in their full integration into being a Jew. And then I'm also put in mind of five years ago, six years ago, Zeb, throughout the most liberal nation states of Europe, not all of them, but some, there was a deliberate movement towards outlawing circumcision. Sure. So your point is that we have a lot of calls, and I do want to get to the point. So the, what would you want to hear from our guests? Something more concrete than feelings, because I'm also put in mind of a woman who was a shouter at a Christian service who was asked by a documentarian, yours truly, how did she feel before she shouted her feeling? And she said, oh, honey, if I depend on a feeling, I would never shout. I said, well, what does that mean? She says, I make a decision. I worship out of a decision. I don't do it on a feeling. Okay, no, I'm going to let I, our I guest. Go ahead, Lisa. I didn't do it on a feeling either. I, I didn't do it on a feeling either. I did, I did what was expected of me, and I, it was really very, very difficult and painful for me. I think we have to... Um, we have to open ourselves up to the possibility that people experience this differently and that, you know, that it's not, this is not monolithic. Everybody has a, a different experience of, of ritual and of this ritual in particular. And I, I don't, I don't think we want to start criticizing other people's response to ritual. It doesn't make sense to me. I also want to add that um, Lisa co-authored a wonderful book 
of alternative welcoming ceremonies, which included a ceremony that was intentionally crafted. These are uh, Jew. This is Hebrew liturgy for alternative Brit Shalom ceremonies. And one of the one of the ceremonies included in in her wonderful book um, emphasizes equality between male and female children, which I think everyone can agree is is not something that uh, that we have, and that Brit, the the Brit Milah ceremony and the weight it carries with it always sort of skews uh, the way we respond to births. Um, and so people should check out Lisa's wonderful book, Celebrating Brit Shalom. Let's let's Thanks, go. Millie. Let's go to Arye and Flatbush. Your question for our guests. Go ahead, Arye and Flatbush. Okay, I'd like to make. Hello. Yes, go ahead, Arye. I'd, I'd like to make two points. I'd like first. I'd like to embellish upon the point that uh, that Rabbi Silver made. Uh, there's, there's a halacha in uh, in the Torah that says you're supposed to chase away the mother bird and you're guaranteed long life when you, if you take from the nest. Now it, it also says you're not allowed to say that God commanded it because of compassion. But it's obviously it's com because of compassion. So why are you not allowed to say it? Because it's, it's very dangerous when you start making equivalencies between human emotions and God's, um, and God's opinions about what's compassionate and what's cruel and what's not cruel. It's very dangerous because, as we see with Lisa, she thinks it's cruel to, uh, that the baby, and the, other, and the other guy, I forgot his name, he thinks it's cruel that the baby experiences pain, but that's really not the case. Uh, as far as God's concerned. That, okay, that's the first point. The second point is, we, um, when it comes to uh, uh, Goyim, uh, non-Jews, sorry, being, being, trying to convert, we push them away. Why do we push them away? Because it's cruel. It would be like saying if you have a son with two clubbed feet, you have to join the track team. Because they don't have the equipment, um, no pun intended, to be a Jew. Because it's, in order to be a Jew, it's necessary to be circumcised, in order to be able to perform the commandments, to have a good shot. It's not impossible, but it's a feat that would be uh, too much to demand to perform all the commandments as, as they are necessary to be performed without So your question to our guest, Arye, is? Do I have to form it in a question? I just make two important points. Oh, you make comments. Okay, anybody, right? anybody, Elio, or Lisa, Rabbi Silva, you want to respond to what... I Arya, yeah, yeah. Go I, ahead, Lisa. I'd like to or I'd Leo? like to clarify something because it's it's a really important misconception that a lot of people have. Um, circumcision does not confer Jewish identity, except if you're a male convert. Then it's part of the conversion process in in many denominations. But generally speaking, there is basically one way to be Jewish, and that's to be born to a Jewish mother. And if you're part of the Reform movement, they include Jewish people who are born to Jewish fathers as well. But circumcision does not confer Jewish identity. Furthermore, uh, Brit Milah, uh, not being circumcised, being an Arel in halachic terms, uh, has almost no practical implications in terms of what a, uh, a Jew can do. And in fact, of course, we know that there are certain people who can't be circumcised because they have congenital disorders. This goes all the way back to the Gemara and Yavamos. Um, so I, I just wanted to clarify that because I think a lot of people think that if you're not, if you're, a, if you're a male and you're not circumcised, you're not Jewish. It's just not true. You're, you're still Jewish. There's no question about it, but that's an important part of being Jewish, which unites reform, conservative and orthodox because everybody, all the three denominations do require circumcision. But it's not just a label that you wear. You have to be a Jew. To be a Jew is to, is to perform as a Jew, to live like a Jew. I appreciate your phone. Robert Silva, do you want to I chime in on that before we get to our next call? No, I'm just, I, I, I agree that Elio is correct, that circumcision does not confer Judaism. That's, that's correct. Again, I still am fundamentally opposed to an organization whose sole goal is to normalize and provide support for those that are actively rejecting a mitzvah. I would actually what, turn the question to Lisa. What, yeah. what, in, your, in your view, what is something that is so fundamental, or is there anything indeed that is so fundamental to Judaism and to Jewish belief that it simply cannot be cast aside? I, I, no, no, I can't make that judgment for other people. I'm not halachic. I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not an Orthodox Jew. Um, but no, is there a I, value that's that's that? that well, I, about personally, I personally feel strongly about Shabbat. I I personally um, think that's important, and you know it would be great if everybody observed Shabbat. 
Um, I have my own modified observance of Shabbat, and I don't. I, I'm not in the business of judging other people who uh, who who maybe find meaning in one thing about being Jewish and not in another. Well, I, neither am I. <laughs> just to be clear, um, but again, I do. I do, uh, as I said earlier. You know, I, I do think that the Torah is the living word of God, and therefore we should encourage keeping all of God's mitzvahs and certainly not encourage those that choose not to. Here's an email question. I believe that those who are not making a bris for their child also do not keep Shabbos and kosher. So what do you, what can we do to keep them in? What can we do to keep them in the fold? I think that's what Bruchim is really, um, is really trying to do. And I think one of the, one of the things is that institutions should be more welcoming to these families um, in my opinion, in, in our opinion, um, it, right. You can't, you can't legislate the, these things. You can't legislate that okay. a family would, right. Would do, would do one mitzvah or another. Um, okay. Let's, let's take two and one more phone call before we break. Let's go to Stan and Forest Hills. Stan and Forest Hills, your question for our guests. Go ahead, please. Well, it's, it, <laughs> I've been laughing at the whole conversation, to be perfectly honest with you. It's a serious conversation. I understand the lady's uh, absolute determining concern about it. Uh, but one, let me understand, she actually let her sons get uh, the bris. Is that correct? Yes. Well, my, my second son had a Brit Law. My first son, we actually uh, circumcised in the hospital. Okay. Um, uh, did you have these feelings before you did the bris? I did. I was reluctant. I, so I was why didn't reluctant. you tell your husband, I don't want to do it? Oh, because of wanting to avoid conflict and the years and the, the, the centuries and, and, and millennia of Jewish tradition. And this is the right thing to do. And all of the, all of the reasons that you, you're articulating, really. Well, here's the point I'm trying to make. Uh, I think your original gut feeling was correct. Uh, I had uh, circumcision when I 1953. My parents took film of the thing, and you see me picked up, and by, of course you don't see blood. But the key point that I'm trying to make is, it does the key thing that uh, you are no less or no more a Jew for having this situation. Do you understand? If you didn't have it, you're still a Jew, no matter what anybody says. And okay? nobody, nobody's arguing that. The question, though, is well. No uh, some would say if he didn't do it, they're not much of, you know, there's a problem that, uh, and I think there is that in on the Orthodox side. But well, there is a the problem thinking. if you're not circumcised. That's an important element. For of them, the for them, for them. Well, it's not, now, so, like I said, it's conservative also find it very important. The reform find it important. Okay, but if so it, it, cuts, it, cuts it across doesn't all make lines. you a Jew. Dev, it doesn't make you a Jew. And I then, mean, it, it's a ritual that you, it's voluntary. It's not mandatory. No, I mean, it is mandatory. No that says you have to do it. It's mandatory to have it. If your parents didn't give you a circumcision, you're obligated by Jewish law to get a circumcision. It's well, mandatory. there are people that challenge the law and say, uh, you know, in these times, it's unnecessary. If your doctor advises not to do it, don't do but it. If there's a health reason, as you heard Rabbi Silver yeah, say before. Yeah, but your babies are born. But I don't think there's a law that says you have to. It doesn't make you any less a Jew one way or the other, Okay. I don't think, you know, just as if you pray a hundred times at Davin, doesn't you make you any more of a Jew than a person who doesn't? Well, listen, does if, you, if, you, if you engage in the mitzvot and the commandments and you give charity and you pray and you learn, does it make you a better person? Does it make yeah, you well, a better well, Jew? Well, Absolutely. Says, let me hear from the lady and the guy. The guy. I want to hear from them. You talk about Lisa, Lisa and Elio. I'll let them respond to you. Right, please. No, I mean, I, I think what you're saying is absolutely correct. I, I said it before. I think that it's important. It's an important misconception to clear up because I think a lot of people think, oh, this is. And, and I mean, there are ways in which Brit Mila is tied into Jewish identity. It's a very personal kind of a mark, but it's very important to state. And no one here has disagreed with this and no one will disagree with it because it's just the truth that circumcision doesn't make you a Jew. It just doesn't. Um, and I, I want to take it a little further and say that. You know, people make assumptions also about the halachic tradition, and and I have found that there's actually some room in the halachic tradition for alternative opinions about this. There's a Gemara in Chulin 
that talks about uh, it's a, the Stom is interpreting a Brysa there, and it, it, it basically says that you can't assume, you can't infer from the fact that a Jew didn't circumcise that they don't keep other commandments. Well, look, let me then, just interrupt. I'm sorry. Here's another one. If you don't have bar mitzvah in your life, it's an important. It's not the end bar of the Bar mitzvah is not the same thing as prayer. Well, it's a ritual. It's, it's a, a ritual. ritual. Listen, there are lots of rituals. If you don't do Tashlach on Rosh Hashanah, it's a but ritual, But it's a ritual. Too. Okay, it's, it's a not ritual. The, but it's not the same thing. It doesn't make you any less a Jew. I didn't say no, it that's does. That's exactly right. And, and I'm, I'm getting the sense, and I think this is wonderful because this is very much in line with Bruchim's mission. I'm getting the sense that Rabbi Silver wouldn't pr- prevent a bar mitzvah boy from having a bar mitzvah just because he wasn't circumcised. That's the sense I get. Am I am I incorrect, Rabbi Silver? Rabbi the, Silver. Yeah, sorry. Um, again, as, as I said earlier, is that, you know, we, we there is, as a result of performance or non-performance of a particular mitzvah, we certainly don't reject any individual. Um, Amazing. That being the case, we do our best to educate and get people to to adhere to what we believe is the word of God. So you know, it's it's embrace the individual and do our best to educate. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's beautiful, right? Because I I'm thinking of examples of Jews who don't perform other kinds of mitzvot, right? Someone who breaks Shabbat or someone who eats chametz on Pesach, right? You're not going to stop them or their children from being bar mitzvah. The opposite, you want to welcome them. That's what our organization is. But does that happen? Does that happen? But the, 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 the issue here is that you're creating a platform to, 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 cre- to normalize this behavior, which is antithetical to Judaism. That's the problem. Behavior? So on an individual level, behavior? there's a fundamental distinction between an individual and an organization and a community that is essentially founded on the notion that we can reject this and still be okay. That's where the distinction lies. And to that... I'm fundamentally opposed. Gee, I, I, I really am just wondering where you think these families should go. What you think these families should be should be should be doing, Rabbi Silver? I mean, I don't. Well, I guess I would ask the, actually ask the question back to you. Has this been a major issue? Well, well the, how, like what are the, what are the statistics on it? I'm we curious. don't know. We don't have the numbers because it's never been studied, and Pew did not study it. The Pew study did not address it. Um, that 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 just came out recently. Um. But we do know that, well, I know from personal experience, having talked to at least eight or nine families in my very own congregation, in my very own congregation alone, who have made this decision. And I've talked to many others who felt they they really, really were regretful that they had done it. Um, and so this is something that you you hear about. It's it's not it's it's not uh, it's sort of under the radar. The conversations are under the radar, and part of the beauty of Bruchim um, is that it does bring this conversation out into the open, like you know from a very pragmatic point of view. What sh- what should be what should be done about these families or these individuals who let the circumcision uh, issue. Keep them away from Yiddishkeit. But let me ask, let me ask, let me ask you a question, though. You know, it's when somebody does a circumcision or doesn't do it, it's a personal thing. So why would somebody who didn't do a circumcision, why would they feel uncomfortable? Are they announcing, hey, I didn't do a circumcision when they walk into a synagogue? Or are they just walking in? Nobody's going to ask them if they're circumcised. Right, so I don't right. understand what, this, what the purpose is I, because they're not yeah, telling people. The, the, the purpose, the point is that, for example, if you want to put your child in a Jewish preschool, there's diaper changing, there's toilet supervision, there, you can't keep this a secret, and and there's all kinds of anxieties related to that. Is this child going to be outed? Is our family going to be uh, shunned? Um, and it shouldn't be that way. I understand that in in um, I understand that from an orthodox point of view, there you you uh, you feel you feel a, a different way. But from a point of view of somebody that is not living a, a halachic life, but who wants community and who wants to connect and who wants to be part of rituals in general and just doesn't want to be part of this ritual. I think that's that's our target. That's well, would, would you think that this is an issue facing many Orthodox organizations, institutions? 
I don't think very many Orthodox institutions know. I would not think so. I don't I, think so. I don't think so either. But I, I think it's it's worth uh, reflecting on the fact that the Orthodox world basically filters these families out de facto, right? So, so if we if we can have a conversation in the non-Orthodox world, and and by the way, that's the majority of Jews in the United States and in the world are not Orthodox, right? The Orthodox make up, according to Pew, about nine percent. They're growing, but it's still a minority. Um, but um, the orth people just assume that they can't be a part of an Orthodox community if they've made this decision. That's something worth reflecting on. I don't think that that necessarily has to be the case. I know rabbis, I personally know rabbis who are not happy about that, who would like to welcome those people into their communities. Um, but we hear stories in our monthly meetings from people all the time about just being completely like when they made this decision, they knew that they couldn't be part of their community or that the rabbi wouldn't give their child a bar, a bar mitzvah. So, you know, this is this is something that we don't have hard data on right now. That is a, a long term goal of our organization is to to collect and provide that to the public. But I think I don't think and, and, and I understand why people assume that the Orthodox world is just shut off to this. But I don't think that that necessarily has to be the case. And, and within uh, the bounds of halacha, there are opinions. Rabbeinu Tam has an amazing statement in, in Zvachim, uh, in the Tosvos there, about, um, you know, he goes out of his way to say that there are some people who don't circumcise their children because they don't want to cause them pain, but their, their hearts are oriented to the heavens. Uh, and he's, but, he's, so, he's, Elio, your position is that an Orthodox institution is, should not be entitled to have basic Orthodox standards as a prerequisite for admission? I don't think that you do, actually. I, th I think, for example... Is there something that's wrong with an organization that thinks that they should? I don't... are talking about I, an Orthodox organization. I don't, know many, or, I, don't know many to, orth I don't know many Orthodox organizations that you know, would ban someone from getting an aliyah for eating chametz on Pesach or for breaking Shabbos. I don't think that's a thing. Um, maybe you think it should be a thing. I definitely think it shouldn't be a thing. I don't think that's a my, good My idea. question is, is it unreasonable for an organization that stands for orthodoxy yeah. and yeah, everything that's included in it to have basic orthodox standards as a prerequisite for membership? I don't. I don't think that's unreasonable. Uh, personally, I think that that's up to the individual, um, the individual organization. But I do think that you may be losing people that you really, that you really may want, that you may want to embrace. And but, that's, I, but, but I think that most really Orthodox is. synagogues are not are, will accept people who may be violators of certain laws and not checking in the door and say, okay, if you, right. if you don't meet this checklist, you can't enter the synagogue, you can't become a member. I think they encourage people from all different backgrounds, whether they're religious or of not, course. to of come. Course. So that's, that's exactly they're embracing. My so, that's exactly my point. It's the reason I'm bringing up people who eat chametz on Pesach. If you eat chametz on Pesach, by the way, it's the same punishment, kares. And people As if who you violate don't you get a bris, right? And people who violate Shabbos, because Shabbos is also called a bris, right? So, like, th that's the reason I brought up those examples. And I, I don't think Orthodox uh, communities, it's not that they shouldn't have the right to make those decisions. I just think that would be a very poorly, uh, a very poor decision. Our guests, oh, go ahead, Rabbi, so then we're going to break. Go ahead. You want no, to it's break? okay. We can break. Our guest organization called Baruchim, they're a support group for those that don't want to do circumcision and want to cut out of Jewish life. Lisa Braver Moses, co founder and president of the Baruchim, Elio Unger Sargon, is a founding executive board member. Rabbi Binyamin Silver is a spiritual leader of the Young Israel of Long Beach. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'm Jackie Mason. And you're probably saying to yourself, how did he wind up here? He's got no place to go. I thought he was a star. I was a star until I got this job. You know what my job here is? My job is here is to talk about Zeb Brenner. Are you saying to yourself, you got nothing better to talk about than this? The truth is I do. But Zeb Brenner said to me, I'm on television. People are watching me. But everybody knows that people are, are excited about me. They know that I have a great show. They know everybody loves me. But nobody cares to advertise on it because they don't know that people are watching it. Who's going to tell them? Somebody has to help out. The United Jewish Appeal is an important cause, but it's nothing compared to this, because the United Jewish Appeal makes a fortune. That's why they can't make a living. You know why? Nobody advertises. You know why they don't? Because they don't know people are watching. 
I'm watching the show, but I found out I'm the only one. Why am I the only one watching? Because nobody advertised. Why don't you advertise? Help this man out if he can't make a living. For free information about advertising on TalkLine's television programs, please call 212-769-1925. That's 212-769-1925. You're listening to Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. And now, here's your host. We're back. We're looking at what this organization, Bruchem, is representing. It's a new group. Got a lot of publicity in the Jewish media through this past week. Our guest, Lever Brava Moss, is the co-founder, president of Bruchem. Elio Unger Sargon is a founding executive board member of Bruchem, and they advocate for those that don't have circumcision. They have a community. Rabbi Benjamin Silver is a spiritual leader of the Young Israel of Long Beach. He is not a member of Bruchem. We're going to get to your emails. In fact, let me take one email first before we get to We have a blazing board, so please get to the point succinctly. Uh, this gentleman writes, is your guest, Elio, still traumatized from his bris? Um, no, I don't remember my bris, and I just wanted to say Rabbi Silver isn't yet a member of Bruchim. I'm not sure if he's playing. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi Silver, yeah, are you playing to join? <laughs> well, definitively not to be becoming a member of Bruchim, but thank you for the clarification. <laughs> <laughs> you, they'll, wa they'll waive the fee if you want to join. Anyway, yeah. let's go to Rifki and Borough Park. Your question for our guests. Go ahead, Rifki and Borough Park. Yeah, let me get this straight. What they are concerned about is the fact that the baby is in pain. Well, do they know that it's the year 2021 and there are ways to keep the baby from being in pain? There's Tylenol, there's Advil, and I'm sure when you did the bris in the hospital, they, they managed that the baby shouldn't have any pain. Is that true? I, I think um, for me, my objections to circumcision go beyond the pain. It's the, it's also the trauma, and it's the ongoing uh, it's it's the ongoing loss of that that so, uh, specialized tissue. Um, oh my God! What I, trauma? What trauma? You know, the two of you remind me of two rebellious teenagers. When you're young now, you fight the world, you fight religion, you fight everything. But what's going to happen when this baby who you're sending, you're planning to send to a, a, a religious or a Jewish preschool, what's going to happen when the baby grows up and the baby says, because, uh, you know, every child is rebellious when they become, when they get to the teenage years. So what's going to happen to your child is when your child gets to the teenage years, it's going to say, wow, I knew nothing about my religion. I want to become religious. I mean, it's happening all the time. I want to become religious. How come I didn't have a bris? And then you know what's going to happen? It's going to happen what the people from Russia who came here to America from the Soviet Union, and they weren't allowed to, to circumcise their children. We should be thankful that we're in America, that we have the privilege to circumcise, to circumcise our children. But the people from the Soviet Union, they're doing it now as adults because they want to identify with being Jewish. It's like well, Revson Jungreis, yeah. Alea Sholem, used to say, there's a pintal yid in everybody. It's from our ancestors, and we get a feeling for religion. Yeah, it's, it's, I don't know about you, but it was worth it for me to come on just to be called a teenager. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to, she's saying you have a spirit of a teenager. I'm a little worried about getting stoned to death, but not, not too bad. Not too bad. But, but the point that, that Rifke is making is an important one, that if a parent does not do a bris meal, does not circumcise their child, there's this French, this franchising their child, they're doing them this favor, because down the road, if their child decides to become more observant, he'll have to go through a circumcision, and he can ask the question, why wasn't I, when 90, what is it, 95%, 90% 90 of Jews, I don't know what the numbers are, but I would dare say that the vast, vast majority of Jews, whether they're Orthodox or not, circumcise their children, their, their male children. Yes, I think that's right. Um, 
there's there's no there's no really easy answer to what you're saying, but I think having a conversation with your child about it is is really um, is is really what's needed. And at, at, the, coming, at the when he's eight days old, you can't have a conversation with your child. We're not right. that advanced yet. Right, but you but you can nurture him and love him and protect him, and that's that's kind of where I'm coming from on that. You know, also as far as the pain goes, you know. Babies go through a lot of pain. They get teeth, and they're in agony. And the pediatrician told one of my daughters, well, would you prefer your child not to get teeth? This is part of life. And circumcision is part of Jewish life. Rifki, excellent well, it point. Is, it is for you, and it was for me, and for some people it's not. Some people look at all the data and come to a different conclusion about it. Anyway, thank you for an excellent call, and we appreciate it. Let's go to David in Brooklyn. He's waiting for over 40 minutes. Thank you for waiting. Your question for our guest. Go ahead, David. Okay, hello. Um, one second. David, we don't have time for now. Move on to the next call. Do you have a question? Hello. For you? Go uh, ahead. Do you have a question for our yeah, guest? Go okay, ahead. okay. Uh, Zev, I have a few comments, and I would like to make my comments without being interrupted. Well, you're not the organizer of the program. We have a limited amount of time, so we're going to ask you to be successful. Okay, I'm waiting, I'm waiting more than a half an hour. I have been waiting, too, but go ahead with your question. All right. Okay, first of all, Zev, I'm very, I don't know what you want to call it, surprised, upset, why you are having these guests. What is this point of that? Number one. Number two, Rabbi Silver, I admire that you come and uh, on the radio to rebut what they're saying, but I think you're being too kind to them. Number three, these two people are, you know, think they're doing the right thing. This is a basic tenet of Yiddishkeit, which in the Soviet Union, people risk their lives to have the children be circumcised, to have a bris Miller. And in Europe, they want to ban the Bismillah, and, uh, and, and which is a basic Jewish tenant, and here come two Jews, and they want to promote the fact that we shouldn't have circumcision. They are basically reformed Jews. This is how the reform movement started, by saying, oh, we can use a, a, a uh, microphone on Shabbos, we can drive to Shul on Shabbos, we can do this, we can do that, they are not Orthodox Jews. They want to be Reformed Jews. That's okay with them. That's okay with me. But by the way, the Reform movement, as I said, is, is, is supportive of circumcision. They're not supportive of I know, but I'm just trying to say this is how the Reform movement started with making little changes. They're no different. These two gen uh, um, ladies and gentlemen are going to be around for another half a year, a year, two years, three years, and they're going to fade from history, and their children are not going to be part of the Yiddish community, like they're four they women. Have, they have a bris. Within, they have, I, at least a child had a bris. Elio doesn't have a child, so they have a bris. I'm just I'm making a point that in the future, just like the reform movement, intermarried and lost, we lost six million Jews voluntarily, this is the same that's going to be with their offspring. They're not going to, they think they're doing just a little change in Judaism, but in the end run, their children and grandchildren are not going to be Jewish. I, mean, I appreciate your phone. You made your point. You're going over. You're saying it again. Obviously, they did give a bris, and we're having a discussion. Here's an email question. David writes, are the guests creating an organization to validate those who choose not to have a bris and have the Orthodox community openly accept that? If you are opposed to bris, aren't you therefore choosing not to align yourself with the Orthodox community? Why does the Orthodox community have to be the scapegoat of individuals' decision? Let those who don't feel comfortable with some of the laws align themselves with those who have their values. Besides, does she think we ship non bris I'm not sure I understand the last line. Did you want to comment so far to what our... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this is an excellent example of what I was saying before, right? That, the, that I get these two responses in the Orthodox world. The first response is what I called... Uh, Rabbi Silver didn't like this, but I called it a Kirov response. Um, or to use Rabbi Silver's language, an education response, right? We need to educate these people. And this is the other one. This is the take it or leave it, right? You don't have to be a part of the Orthodox community if you want to, don't want to do this, so stop talking to us about it. And my response to that is the same as what I said before, which is um, I don't I, I don't respond well to take it or leave it because there's so much I want to take. 
<laughs> and there's there's very little that I want to leave. I I'm, I'm a proud Jew. I'm you consider uh, so you grew up Orthodox. Do you consider yourself Orthodox today? By the way, I, I I do not consider myself Orthodox today, but I I there, there's a lot of my lifestyle that would look very Orthodox to the naked eye. Um, I learn regularly. I have Shabbat practice. We have people over when it's not a pandemic. You know. Um, I, I just, you know, the way I, I approach the Jewish tradition is very deeply influenced by my upbringing and my, my ability to learn and my appreciation of the beauty of the Jewish tradition and the idea that I have to sort of take it or leave it. I, I, and I think Rabbi Silver probably is not comfortable with the take it or leave it approach either based on what he said here. I, I don't want to speak for him, but maybe Rabbi Silver wants to jump in and say how he well, feels. I, I would just make a few, a, a few observations is that... I think there's a there's a there's a wide difference between a take it or leave it and rejection of a basic tenant and then still the desire to be embraced by the rest of it. It's almost in my other life I'm a lawyer as well. It's almost like taking the <laughs> taking taking a oath as a lawyer but saying I accept everything. I love the law, I love the analysis, I love arguing cases, I love writing briefs. I just reject the authority of the Supreme Court and I reject the notion of a Senate. It, but still accept me as I am. At a certain point, it becomes absurd on its face. So, you know, to say I'm, I, I love all of these things and I still demand acceptance when I, you know very well that you're rejecting a very basic tenant of that very same group that, you know, smacks of a certain absurdity. Now, that being the case, I do repeat what I said earlier, and that is, is that, of course, on an individual level, absolutely is that it's not it's not a take it or leave it and we embrace every jew but we embrace every jew with the with the intention of trying to educate and guide guide in the ways of god i Let told it. you lisa this guy's going to be great on our bruchim rabbinical advisory committee and you, <laughs> and you know what he's going to find going to be a cut above the rest because he's going to advocate circumcision anyway oh. <laughs> here's an email question girls have pain while getting earrings do they oppose that too okay Let's go to Jeff in Manhattan. Go ahead, Jeff in Manhattan. Your question for our guests. Yeah, I want to make three quick points. Like, uh, like Zev, you and other people said, like, it's accepted. A lot of people go to observant Orthodox synagogues, but they're not kosher. And, that, and we accept that. And I'm not Orthodox either. But there are no support groups for Jews that don't eat kosher. They just don't eat kosher. But everybody, everybody's fine. And nobody brings a bacon uh, sandwich to the synagogue, number one. Number two, to the best of my knowledge, circumcision is considered more healthy in many ways than not being circumcised, and that's why the majority of non-Jews are, are circumcised in this country. And three, the, the people that want to um, <clears throat> form this organization, they seem like really good people, so I don't want to put them down. I don't want to sound like I'm putting them down, but what I'm thinking of is, like, you take college-age kids today. You have some heroic men and women, 18 to 22, that are in the armed forces. In, in the U.S., in Israel, and, and other countries, and some of them wind up with horrific injuries or, di or die. And then you have college kids that say something is too difficult for them to hear, so they, they shouldn't hear it, and that leads to cancel culture. And it's sort of like bringing cancel culture to Judaism. This is too tough, so we don't want to have it. Any kind of surgery, as people mentioned, is going to hurt. Circumcision is generally considered healthful, and sure, it's painful to look at it, Finally, it's been going on for thousands of years, and nobody has concluded that Jewish men are messed up. I mean, there's a, I mean, there's a high preponderance of Nobel Prize winners and, and things like that that are Jewish males. So it doesn't mess them up. And it's, you know, I, think that, I, I think that if you really are opposed to circumcision, fine, go to your rabbi, and, and they'll, they'll tell you, fine, we're not going to impose it on you. But to have a support, support group and stuff to make a thing on it, it really is a diminution of Judaism, and it's, it's, it's like these college kids that need these safe rooms because they can't hear something that's difficult when some of their peers are actually you know, fighting battles and getting hurt, and these people just don't want to be exposed to ideas. I'm not making a direct analogy, but it, it, you know, one analogy is, is, all right, fiddle on the roof. So the first daughter wants to marry the tailor that she loved instead of the guy she was fixed up, so he goes, all right. Second one wants to marry a guy and go far away and something, so he goes, "All right." The third one wants to marry a non-Jew and he goes, "No, this I can't accept." And so that's the way I feel. I think, and I'm a very liberal person and a liberal Jew. You want to tackle that, yeah. uh, either Yo, Elise, or Rabbi uh, Silver? Anybody want to respond to Jeff in Manhattan, who's a liberal, 
a Jew and living in the Upper West yeah, Side of Manhattan. Yeah, I, I think this is this is optional. This is Bruchim is optional. It's for people who want that support, and it's for institutions that already are sending a, a message of inclusion to other groups that um, and and welcome to other groups that may want to think about this particular issue. And that's what Bruchim is. Well, no one's um, saying it's not optional if the parents really uh, disagree with it. But the idea of a support group, it's like, I, I don't want to sound hard, but it's like people getting too soft. They need a support group. Like, you need a, like it's if you need a support group. It's not, so much, it's not so much about being it's not so much about being hard or soft um and the reason there isn't a support group for people who don't eat kosher is because there's a don't ask don't tell policy about that and some synagogues in some communities have a don't ask don't tell policy about circumcision no um, that that, that I, let me just say that's not really true like like i i have many friends that are orthodox that even say call them observant they know i'm not you know i go to temple on yom kippur i fast and everything but generally, they see me not being observant, and it's accepted because my heart is in the right place, and I'm part of the Jewish people. And it's right. the same thing. Right. So, but so we don't need right. But there's so no we don't support need, group for me. There's no support, we don't need a support for group for people who are not Sabbath observant in the Jewish right. community because they're accepted and embraced. But what our experience has shown us is that this particular issue, probably having something to do with the fact that it's a bit of a taboo and people don't like to talk about it. It creates a kind of magnetic repulsion for those families from Jewish communities, and we're trying to to make that to, to I don't take that. But, 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 but what Jeff is saying is not a matter of conversation. Where you can have a support group for Jews that have tattoos because that's something that's taboo also. And if, uh, if they were being alienated from the Jewish community, but they're not being alienated. Uh, In other words, nobody. They... And now here's your host. The question, if, but here's the point that I said earlier. Nobody asks anybody who walks into a synagogue, are you circumcised? It's, it, but that's not, that's not true. It's, it's true in the sense that someone walking into a synagogue doesn't get asked that. But it's also true, all of the things that Lisa talked about with daycare, with Jewish schools, with Jewish community centers. And, of course, the bar mitzvah question, the, I mean, the conservative movement, for example— has uh, on the books a statement that they, they won't give a bar mitzvah to a boy who's not circumcised. Now, we're hoping to change that because we don't think that that's a good thing. We think that those families should be embraced. We think that those people who are not circumcised, those boys who are not circumcised, who want to have a bar mitzvah should be able to have a bar mitzvah in a conservative synagogue. Right, but, but, but what you're saying, what, what you're saying is, is akin to, you're asking the rabbis, even in conservative, to do something that, that, uh, that they don't believe in it. To me, it's well, like then, saying then that they should have a break fast in the middle of Yom Kippur, not after the holiday, but in the middle of the holiday because some people want to eat during the holiday. You don't do that. And so we, we, everybody no, will, no. I think, accept that the, you're, no. you're not... Wait, wait, let me just finish real quick. We, we, I think, I'm speaking for myself, but I think I'm speaking for a lot of people, will accept, if, even though not agree with, but accept your decision. But to have a whole group and, and, and normalize it, it, I think is wrong and unnecessary, and I do think it's a softness. I, I think that, you know, you just, you don't want to have your child circumcised, fine. Don't do it. You don't have to advertise it. No one's going to reject you, at least as far as I know. People in, 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 in schools are going to be sympathetic to this and accepting that. I'm sure the rabbis will tell them, hey, they, they, they believe in Judaism. They're part of us. Let's accept them. Their child isn't circumcised, so let's give them that consideration and privacy and not ostracize them. And I think that's what will happen. But what you're doing is saying, well, you know, this is a, a, a thousand-year tradition, and we're saying it's not necessary. And right, let me just say one Georgia. thing. 30 seconds. No, we're, we're not time. saying All right, it's not Really, one thing. Let me just say in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a funny note. My fra one of my favorite, you know, parody commercials on Saturday Night Live of all time, they used to have car commercials about the smooth ride and how smooth it was. And to prove how smooth it was, they had a rabbi giving a circumcision in the car. But, but you know, it is a unifying principle of, Ju of Judaism, and Jewish men, by and large, are not messed up from it. And I'll, I'll that. That. Excellent call. I appreciate your phone call about that. Okay, we're going to continue our conversation. Uh, when we come back, uh, our guests are with an organization called Bruchim. Uh, they are a support group for those that want to cut out circumcision. Leva Brava Moss is the co-founder of President Bruchim. Elio Unger Sargon is a founding executive board member of Bruchim. Rabbi Benjamin Silver is not a member of Bruchim. He is the spiritual leader of the Young Israel of Long Beach. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.
Hi, this is David Gabay, and you're listening to the Zev Brenner Show. You're listening to Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. We're back. Our final stretch. We're looking at an organization, Bruchim, which got a lot of media attention this week. And they are a support group for those that want to cut out circumcision from a Jewish life. Lisa Brava Moss is co-founder and president Bruchim Elio Unger Sargon is a founding executive board member of that organization. Rabbi Benjamin Silver is a spiritual leader of the young Israel of Long Beach. We're if you getting to as many of your calls as we can. Let's go to Gadi in Midwood, Brooklyn. Go ahead, Gadi in Midwood. Your question for our guest. Well, I don't have a question. What I want to say was that 150 years ago in this country, Dr. Kellogg from Battle Creek, Michigan, stated that to be a good American, you should eat cornflakes and also you should become circumcised. It's a very, that's why America, everyone is circumcised. This is where the movement started. Number one. Number two, the British royal family, all the males are circumcised by a mohel. Oh, by, by a mohel? In the... All the all the British royal family, the males are circumcised by a mohel. Well, I guess they won't be accepted into Bruchim then. <laughs> all right. But they will become accepted in the British royal family. <laughs> all right, thank you for your phone call. Let's go to Kensington, Brooklyn. Avraham in Kensington, thank you for patiently waiting. Your question for our guests, go ahead, Avraham in Kensington. Yes, let's say that there's a gentleman who rejects the covenant of Abraham and is not circumcised, and uh, the Orthodox community embraces him and says even though he has sinned, he is still an Israelite. Uh, can they exempt him from the liability of excision, kores, and is he allowed to marry a Jewish woman? Uh, could the guest please explain what it means by excision? Rabbi Silver, I think that's the best to you. Go ahead. Uh, um. So your question is primarily whether or not someone who's uncircumcised, are they, is he exempted from curse? Yes, because we, we're, we're tying everything up to the fact that he needs to be embraced by the Orthodox community. So I'm asking if the Orthodox community can give him a get-out-of-jail-free pass on the uh, punishment of Kores. Uh No, absolutely not. They cannot. Okay, could you please describe to the audience what Kores is? The race is essentially uh, eternal damnation. We believe it's the most distant and most severe punishment that we have, and effectively it means eternally being cut off from God's grace in the world to come and forever. Are you allowed to marry him to a Jewish woman? So uh, that is an interesting halachic question, and um, and um, that's an interesting question. Uh, I would. Yeah, you're asking, would, should an Orthodox rabbi uh, uh, officiate at that wedding? That would be, you know, each rabbi would have to make his own decision. You're asking if there's a technical halachic issue with a uncircumcised Jewish male marrying a Jewish woman. The answer is no. In other words, I, but the same thing if somebody, for example, eats uh, eats bread on Passover. Also, the punishment is courage, which is excision. Um, so obviously there is there is no prohibition from him getting married to another Jewish person, even though he committed a grave sin. Oh, forgive me. I'm appealing to the argument that the uh, brothers of Dina presented to Shechem. W were they talking through their hats, or was that something that was halachic? Yeah, essentially that was just a ploy. All right. Uh, okay. Thank, thank you. you very thank, much. thank you for an interesting question. And we're 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 closing out. So I'm curious, how large of an organization is Bruchim? You're advocating for the rights of people who are uncircumcised, you know, to have a support group. But how many people are actually out there that are taking advantage of your service? Uh, can you give us an idea of numbers and figures? Because it may be a very small amount of people that really can even be members of your group. Well, we've, um, <clears throat> we, we don't know how many families are opting out of circumcision, as I mentioned before. But, but how many people are, are, have, are part of Bruchim? That was my question. Oh, are part of Bruchim. Yeah, there, we have about 15 uh, members that are, that are team members and then maybe 10 or 15 others who are, who are loosely affiliated with the group. But, but now our email list is getting longer and longer since 
the um, since the articles came out about this um, this week, last week. Um, <clears throat> So we have we have more and more people wanting information and wanting to be on our mailing list. Ellie, do you have any insights about this? I mean, I would just say, yeah, like Lisa said, we are still collecting data about American Jews on this question. Long term, we hope to actually do a proper survey and get a sense of what percentage of American Jews are opting out. No one knows the answer to that question right now. But I can tell you just anecdotally, you know, we started our Zoom, our monthly Zoom meetings over the pandemic, and every meeting just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, the more people hear about us, the more we find people who are alienated from the Jewish institutional and communal world who are sort of enjoying our community. And uh, we hope to serve as many American Jews who have made this decision as we possibly can. But when you say can. alienated from the Jewish world, you're talking beyond circumcision then, because you can be circumcised and be alienated and vice versa. So uh, somebody who is, 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 is an adult, for example, he has no choice if, if he was circumcised or he wasn't circumcised. When you say alienated, to me it sounds like you're opening up a whole different, different uh, Pandora's box. Well, it is... I think connected. I think we're trying to make the argument, you, you're very perceptively picking up on that, that um, what we're dealing with is essentially connected to other areas of Jews being alienated from Jewish communal life. And there, there, there are lots of reasons why a Jew might be alienated uh, in, the, in 2021. And we've just discovered, this is sort of a, you're right, it's a Pandora's box. It's kind of an opening into a much larger and broader problem that we think uh, we have something to say about. So obviously you can embrace those that have tattoos or don't want to keep kosher, don't want to keep Shabbos, don't want to do anything, any other rituals or mitzvahs of the Torah, you can broaden the base. So that's so you're using this as a, as a jumping board for other issues as well. Is that what I'm gleaning? I mean, I, I, I think we are very much focused on this issue. Um, as an organization, but philosophically, we align ourselves with people who want to embrace people who make other kinds of decisions about all sorts of things. Yes. Rabbi Benjamin Silver, any final thoughts? I guess my final my final thought would really be just a question to Elio and Lisa, and that is is that you guys really want your names to be associated in Jewish history as the ones that normalize not getting a bris mila? Well, we're, we're not doing this for publicity, if that's what you mean. We're, we're, um, we're, we, 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 I would like to have the Jewish community, the institutional Judaism be more welcoming to these families. And I would like these families to be more brave about seeking out Jewish involvement um, in, in spite of having made that decision, that, that they, they should know that they have, they have many more, um, they have meant much to offer. Yeah, but, but, um, but Lee, forgive me for interrupting, but what I've been saying all along is that there is, the Jewish community and even Orthodox settings are not closing the door to people who are not circumcised. You're talking right. about a daycare situation or we're going to a Jewish school and a daycare, which would, by the way, which would be the Orthodox conservative, which would be a whole different thing. So the community is welcoming. I mean, I belong to, and I go to many Orthodox synagogues, and I can tell you that people from all walks of life, I see people with earrings walking, people with tattoos walking, and, and they are accepted and embraced in the Orthodox Jewish communities and Jewish synagogues that I've gone to. So I don't see where they're not being embraced. Um, so your whole premise is that, well, they're being rejected and they're being turned down. I just don't see it. Forgive no, I me. think show it's, me, more, show me. it's more subtle than it's more complicated than that. In this particular case, it's you're talking about genitals. It's it's very um, it's very anxiety producing for a for a family to make this decision and then not be sure whether they're they're welcome or not, not be sure whether the preschool will will um, shame them or something like that. But you're um, assuming that they're going to shame them. They don't. You don't have any situations we, where we, you have. We don't. We, we don't. We don't know. We don't know what. The, but you're basing on a premise that doesn't families, exist. Well, I don't think that's the case. I, I think the, the the problem does exist because we know families that are that have decided not to participate in Jewish life because of this. So, it's it. You know, I think it's it's um, it's fine for you to criticize it. It's just 
we feel that there's a need and we certainly have been experiencing this as as Eliyahu was saying on our Zoom meetings that more and more people are showing up and more and more people are wanting to join our mailing list and so on. And listen, joining a mailing um, list doesn't mean that they're, listen, I join many mailing lists, even things that I don't necessarily approve of or want to be part of, just want to know what's going on. Let's. I, I, wanna, I wanna follow up with what Lisa was saying and yeah. also answer Rabbi Silver's question. Um, so uh, as, as Lisa mentioned, on our monthly Zooms, we've been hearing more and more stories. We've had to sort of devote more and more time to people telling their stories. And they're, they're really, you know, coming out of the woodwork. It's a taboo subject. So it's the sort of thing that you have to kind of coax. You have to get people to talk about it because it's not a comfortable subject. But to Rabbi, to Rabbi Silver's point, I'm really proud of the work we're doing at Bruchim. I am proud to be associated with it. And part of my pride comes from the incredible resilience of the Jewish tradition and the ability of the Jewish tradition to assimilate new information and uh, to adapt to critiques and challenges, and in fact, for critiques and challenges to be an essential part of the Jewish tradition. To me, that's an essential part of my Jewish identity. It's always been an essential part of the Jewish tradition. And I'm not worried about my place in Jewish history because the Jewish tradition is going to be just fine with or without. Yeah, Shivan Panelanto, the 70 fastest of Torah, but all that, but it'll also be part of the tradition. Let's see if we can squeeze in Gedalia and Borough Park. 30 seconds. You're going to be the final call. Go ahead. Thank you so much. I am just blown away listening to your guests. These people think that they are smarter than Hashem. They think that this such serious mitzvah as circumcision is just. Uh, uh, just another, you know, uh, just another uh, uh, something to throw on the pile. This is ridiculous. Anyway, I appreciate your phone call. We're out of time. So I want to thank you, Lisa Brava Moss and Elio Unger Sargon of the organization Bruchim. We didn't agree, but we're a form of exchange of ideas. So we're glad you're able to participate. Thank on you our so thank you. much, Zev. We really appreciate it. And Rabbi Brenner, thank you so much for having us. And I've really appreciated the conversation. You created a wonderful space here for dialogue. And Rabbi Benjamin Silver, the spiritual leader of Young Israel of Long Beach, thank you for participating. I know you have an early morning schedule as well. So thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful evening. And Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Are you interested in hosting your own radio show and podcast, or perhaps a TV program? Talkline Network can help you get on the air from one hour weekly to 24 hours a day. Ideal for ethnic, foreign language, medical, business, and religious broadcasting. We also have full-time radio stations for lease, as well as FM HD channels. For more information, please call 212-769-1925. That's 212-769-1925. Or email zevrenner at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. For continuous Jewish programs, talklinenetwork.com or our 24-7, 365-day